Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. Just ahead on today's episode. And then slowly, right around the time of Clueless is where the pretending became different. The be- instead of pretending, it was, I'm going to be that guy I know about. Like I, the skater guy, he was a skater stoner. Right. I was a skater, never smoked weed in my life, but I knew stoners. And I knew how they talk. I knew how they walk. I'm 50. It was weird. That was funny. And I always thought about, uh, I remember when, I think it was Mac, when Macaulay Culkin turned 40 or something, he sent out a social media thing that was like, hey, you want to feel bad? The guy from Home Alone's 40 now. You know, <laughs> Brittany Murphy was one of the greatest people I know. Britt passed away as an adult, but she's one of those people who I always think about. I wish I could see what she would have done now. Some teen movies only hit home with their target audience teens. Most of those films come and go from theaters without a lot of fanfare. But once in a while, a movie comes along with adorable characters and spectacular lines that live on forever, filed away under smarmy in our vocabularies. In 1995, one skateboarding stoner character won over audiences with his slightly buzzed kindness. He immediately became a heartthrob who would go on to bring that charm and talent to dozens of productions, both in front of and behind the camera. Whatever. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Now, don't be totally bugging, but join me with today's guest from Clueless, Brecken Meyer. Hi, Brecken. Hi, Steve. Thanks for stopping by. No worries. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, tell me, if, if somebody were to ask you if they'd never met you or uh, kind of like me. Sure. And wanted to know what you did. Yeah. How would you describe what you do? My friends and I always said, uh, and I always say this to my kids, like my, my parents were academics, and I always say my parents were academics, and I put on makeup and pretend to be other people. <laughs> That's it. I put on makeup and pretend to be other people for a living, and when I started acting, I was saying, I was 11, and I was pointing at the TV going, I want to do that, but I was pointing at Tom and Jerry. I mean, I wasn't pointing at I Love Lucy or, you know, Spencer Tracy or anything like that. Yeah. I was literally pointing at Tom and Jerry and the Smurfs, going, I want to do that, and I didn't know what that meant. Now you do. Now I slightly do. But yeah, so I would say I joke that I'm either a trained monkey or I say that, you know, I put on makeup and pretend to be other people. What was your first acting job? A Supercuts commercial. Uh, I had long hair as a kid and I had a Supercuts commercial. And I, I remember vividly the audition. It was the first improv thing I ever did where they said, turn around like you're in the chair and he takes the smock off and you like your haircut. That's the direction. And I was 11, and I turned around and went, whoa, this is rad. And the guy went outside and said to my mom, who was the anti-stage mom, uh, could you come in for a second? And I was like, oh, shit, what did I do? I already got in trouble. And he said, have you ever seen your son on camera? And she's like, no, and I don't care to, you <laughs> know, whatever. <laughs> and he showed her the tape. And he goes, look at that. And he's like, see how natural he is? And my mom and I both were like, I don't see what you're talking about. My mom's like, that looks like my kid. And that looks like him, and he sounds like him. And I, ex- I mean, I remember vividly the cadence going, whoa, this is rad, because that's what I said to my friends. And I didn't understand what he saw. I still don't. But I got the commercial. You were being you. I was just being a natural kid. Yeah, I was just being me, who uh, got a nice haircut. And then the funny thing was I had long hair, and my mom's one agreement was, you can do this commercial, they cannot cut your hair. Oh, they cannot they cut, cannot your, cut hair. your hair. And I was uh, like, that was Mom. my next question. Did you get a free no, haircut? No, I was like, Mom, it's a Supercuts commercial. And she was like, Supercuts is not that good in my opinion. I don't want them cutting your hair. And, my, and by the way, it wasn't like I was Samson and my mom like loved my hair. That was just kind of, I think it was kind of her anti-stage mom thing of like, you can use my kid. You can't mess with him though. You can't cut his hair. And, I, and then it was a, a gig. Gary Shandling was a very good friend of mine. I met him... Uh, I mean, I, I was friends with Gary for about 15 years, and but before that, I had gotten, I had booked the Gary Shandling, sh- it's Gary Shandling show, his first show, as his nephew or his neighbor's son, but they wanted to dye my hair brown, because the dad was Sonny from Greece, so I, and I'm forgetting his name right now, but Sonny in the movie Greece, who's a dark, curly-haired guy, and again, my mom was like, can't dye his hair. And again, my mom was not like, oh, your hair is so beautiful. She wasn't like, honey, boo-boo or anything like that. She was just like, I don't want you to change my kid. If he wants to do it, fine. And she was like, do you want to dye your hair? I was like, I, like, I don't want to be, I don't want to dye my hair. She's like, let's not do the job. I'm like, okay. That was it. So now it has a little silver. A little. Now it's got, now it's got a lot of silver in it. And, uh, but it's there, so I'm happy about that. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, um, 
so yeah, so that uh, that was my first commercial was a Supercuts commercial. And yeah. after that, what did you do next? I had a really gradual progression. You know, like I grew up, you know, in my age range, it was me, Toby, Leo, Seth Green, Ethan Embry, all these guys uh, who started when we were really young. Um, and I just gradually worked. I booked Supercuts, and I did an Applejack's commercial, and then I did a guest spot on L.A. Law as the abused kid on the stand. And then I did, you know, so it was really gradual. It was never, boom, there you're, you're, you're in a movie and suddenly you're known like Matt, like Macaulay Culkin or anything like that. I never had that. Luckily, it was a great thing. It turned out to be a great thing because I was never bombarded. I was never, again, I never had a stage mom. And so I just gradually worked and it always became, my mom and I had an agreement, which was, hey, as long as it's fun for you, I'll take you to auditions. But, if you drink or get caught with drugs, now again, your parents have to take you to audition until you're 16. If you do anything before you're 16, 16, after you're 16, I can't do anything. I can't control you. I mean, you'll still live in a house and stuff, but I can't drive. You can drive at 16. And so she said, but until then, if I'll take you to auditions. I don't like them, but I'll take you to them. But you got to keep your grades up and you got to be a good human. And that was it. So it was always, do you want to keep doing it? Are you still having fun doing it? You still have to go to school, still have to do your homework. So I was real lucky that I never, looking back now, I never had that one thing where at 10 I couldn't go anywhere. Or adults were yelling at I never had that. I was always very gradual. I worked, I tend to work in the summer or when finals were. I think that was subconscious. I'd book a gig during finals <laughs> so I wouldn't have to take them. Um, so yeah, so it was. I was very lucky that I never, you know, like when, Titanic blew up for Leo, I think. I can't remember. You guys know, 18 or 19 or something. Um, but I worked with Soleil Moonfry after Punky Brewster and saw, and Soleil's an incredible person, in spite of all she went through as being famous as a kid. So I saw it, but I was always on the kind of outside of it, looking at going, oh, man, that looks like it would suck. And I don't have to worry about that. And I, you know. Did you ever take acting lessons or anything, or was it just on-the-job training? Yeah, it was on-the-job training. I booked... I got an agent when I was 11 through a girlfriend, my hand-holding girlfriend when I was 11. Got me an audition with an agent. And I remember I had to do it. This is, I apologize to your viewers because you guys can take a nap for this. But my first audition was for a, they, you go to the agency, and in order for them to decide if they want to rep you, they give you a little commercial to read. And mine was for a peanut butter, peanut, uh, Peter Pan peanut butter commercial. And you were supposed to clap your hands for Peter Pan. I remember the line. And I went in and did it. And they were like, great, you should take some acting classes, but we'd like to represent you if you take some acting classes. And I was like, cool, I'm not going to do that because I'm doing this for fun and I don't, I don't look at it like that. I'm 11. I just want to have fun. Um, so I did. So I never took classes. I just on the job learned. I was pretending. And then slowly, right around the time of Clueless is where the pretending became different. The be, it, it, instead of pretending, it was, I'm going to be that guy I know about. Like I, the skater guy, he was a skater stoner. Right. I was a skater, never smoked weed in my life, but I knew stoners and I knew how they talk. I knew how they walk. And I was also a little bit of an obnoxious mimic. So when they said he's a stoner, I go, great, Spicoli from Fast Times, who coincidentally was directed by Amy Heckerling, who did Clueless. And it was, okay, I'll take that from Sean Penn. And oh, Bill and Ted's one of my favorites and Keanu Reeves blowing doors off and Parenthood. And I loved his physicality. He always had this thing of, uh, it was always this hop to Keanu Reeves. And I remember the minute I read Clueless, like, oh, that's who it is. And so I went in there and took Spicoli and Keanu and put it together. And it was the first time it felt like, oh, I, I created a character. I created this guy. Instead of just saying the words and looking charming or smirky, um, I had this guy where I was like, oh, I'm going to be that guy and have fun with it. And then I noticed that I could stay in the character and even improv, there's some improv in line, there's some improv in Clueless that just came out of the day because we were so in the, not methody, like in character, you couldn't talk to me, call me Brecken, but, or Travis, I don't care. Um, but it was just, it was the first time where I really created the character. And coincidentally, I was around 18 or 19 where I was like, oh, I think this is a different level of acting. I think this could be different. And then it really, so it was, it was fun for me because I, from 11 to 19, I'd been doing this certain type of performing, copying, mimicking, whatever. And then at 18, it went to a kind of another level. I was like, oh, 
And I overused the word fun, but it became another level of fun. And I mean that in a dramatic one, uh, sense as well. It was just a good time. Like it was neat. Like, oh, I can get into the head of other people as well, not just the exterior. This is going to be interesting. Clueless was a pretty big movie. Yeah. it. I, Did it change your life? No, not. I mean, uh, that's interesting. Um, I would always say no. And now as I'm about to turn 50, I'd go, yeah, looking back, probably. I mean, I definitely got opportunities I would have never gotten because of those um, friendships I still have. Um, so, yeah, I think it in hindsight, it did at the time it was. It was neat. Um, I was on a sitcom before the movie came out, so I was it was very interesting. I was booked, meaning I couldn't do anything when Clueless came out. Like I couldn't use the heat of that for another movie or anything like, right off the back because I was on a series um, and I couldn't get off. So until my hiatus, I couldn't work on, a, on something else. Um, so that, again, kind of kept me sheltered from all the crazy. Um, I still got to work, and obviously I was happy working. Um, but now I look at it more. Like now it's so funny that there are Halloween costumes. Every year of people dress as Cher, of course, but also I get Travis things. And the, the number one fan encounter I always remembered was Older than me, a guy came up to me, ran, ran across the street to stop me. And, you know, I mean, close when I was 19 or t- came out when I was 20, I think. And he said, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just want, I don't mean to bother you. I just want to tell you, I went to rehab and got sober. And I'm however many, you know, I don't remember, it was two or three years after the movie. And I got sober because I figured if Travis Birkenstock could do it, I could do it. And there was, it was a hybrid of emotion when he told me. First of all, I was like, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And then when he left, I was like, that's fucking insane that that character made you, just because he's such a light, fluffy character, you know, it's like a Labrador. And so you're like, wow, Labrador made you go to rehab. Okay. And whatever, by the way, whatever gets you there. Fantastic. Um, But that was the first time where I was getting like, I remember I was in Jerry's Deli and it was the first time I got stopped. And it was like a real, like, while you're eating kind of like, oh, hi. And I didn't, it didn't bother me, but it was just interesting. Um. The only thing it did was it cut down my ability, which I think a lot of actors have. It cut, it, it hindered my ability to people watch mm. as much as I like to do. Like my, I mean, I could sit in, if my flight gets delayed for the most part, unless you got to be somewhere, I'm never that upset because I kind of like sitting in airports, people watching. Um, that was the only thing, the only positive thing I could say about the pandemic was because the mass, everyone was anonymous. So you oh, could yeah. sit, I could sit around and no one would, you know. Um, but like Seth, like Seth Green is one of my best friends and, producing partners uh seth he's got flame red hair he's a mm-hmm. beacon so if he doesn't you know during the pandemic he could put a hat on no one knew who he was it was great but um so yeah i think uh, clueless looking back now sure it definitely changed but it's amazing the the longevity it's had is un, it's just silly to me it's i mean in a great way i mean silly in a i can't it's unbelievable it's so funny you hear nightmares of, about kids in hollywood and- it's non-stop i mean i you know Again, Brittany was one of the be- Brittany Murphy was one of the greatest people I know, and I knew Britt way before Clueless. We played boyfriend and girlfriend, I think, four times before Clueless. So when they when we auditioned together, it was like, oh, this is easy. Um, and then Britt and I did King of the Hill together for eight years, and then I took over for a role she did, not when she passed away, before that, like the character's voice changed, and I took over, but she was still Luann on King of the Hill. So I see, you know, after Clueless, Brittany and I worked together for another eight years, and she was, you know, Britt passed away as an adult, but she's one of those people who I always think about. I wish I could see what she would have done now because, again, Brittany was so crazy talented and only the surface had been t- dealt with. Like, she's, she was such a good singer. And seeing how many people now cross over into music and movies, I was like, oh, I would have loved to have seen Brittany do that. Did her death hit you hard? Yeah, it sucked. It was, uh, yeah, it was really bad. Um I wish I could say I was I, I wish I could say I was more surprised when it happened, um, just because of that. It's her business, or whatever. But that toxic guy she was with, Simon, was just a fucker. <laughs> and so um, I knew Britt before, I knew during, and then when she passed away. And it was uh, the the amount of things that just a small. It's a small world. Philippi Ryan, who was a very who was a very close friend of mine, lived five houses from Brittany. So literally we were there when the sirens were going on and we didn't know what it was, but we were hanging at Phil's house when the sirens are going up to, I think it was Britney Spears' old house, Britney Murphy's new house, um, when we all heard it was terrible. I mean, Britney was, 
I mean, she was a bottle of soda. She was the sun. She was so effervescent and great. And for her to be, for her to, you know, pass away like that and in such a shitty way and in such a toxic relationship, it just was terrible. It was just, not only because your friend, but because of what everyone else doesn't get to see anymore. Um, but yeah, that was, that was, that sucked in the same way. Yeah, yeah it was terrible. You and Seth were photographed for an issue of GQ magazine. Probably. Back in the <laughs> late 90s or early 2000s. Okay. I only know because they picked, they took a picture of me too. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> okay. Of, of how I dressed on the red carpet or something oh, like right that. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. And I had my dog <laughs> with me and, and they, it was a little Yorkshire Terrier, Stella. And they stuck her in my tuxedo and... Took a picture of me. I thought it was pretty neat. Yeah. And that I was in the, an issue with you guys. Was Seth in my tuxedo? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, or I'd be in his either way. We're both, we're both knee high to a grasshopper. Oh, but. careful. Uh, on the topic of fun, yeah. um, are you still having fun? Yeah. You mean in the job? Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely am. And then about probably about t 12 years ago, I started writing as well. And that was another outlet that became very fun just I just, again, I overused the word. It just was so enjoyable. I had so much fun with it. Seth and I have been writing a show, our animated show, Robot Chicken, for 14 years now. So I get to work with my best friend on a side project that's not the acting thing. It's super um, enjoyable. And then I wrote a show, you know, Men at Work. I wrote a sitcom that I got to run. I never knew what a showrunner was. And suddenly I was running a show for three years. Um, and then on Franklin and Bash, I started writing on that. And it was just, honestly, it was another level of enjoyment of the process. And then it also made me look at acting in a different way because I was creating even more than just creating a character. I was now creating a world. Um, and that was really enjoyable. I still love doing that. I mean, that's become a big part of my world. I forget who said it originally, but uh, I always, I like, I like the sound of it. If you're doing something you like, you won't work a day in your life. Yeah. And it really is true, isn't yeah. it? Oh, I absolutely. I mean, even, again, actors are... The worst thing is, uh, you know, and I get it. Everyone has tough jobs. Everyone has tough days. So it's always tough when you hear any actor whine. The first thing you want to say is like, oh, shut up. You get paid to pretend, blah, blah. I get that. But also, it's a job. And there are times you're away from your family where you're sitting in a in a room for seven hours. And then, by the way, we're not getting your shot today. And then, by the way, you're still getting paid. It's You could be digging ditches. It could be much worse. But even that, after seven hours, you're like, really? I just didn't do anything anything today like oh that's just that doesn't feel good but um yeah absolutely I, I still have fun with it and it changes and it gets tough and it gets interesting and everything about it being pigeonholed fighting out of that all the things that have happened in a career um I joke with Seth that we're vets of this now which is so funny being 49 well that's uh, one of the things I'd like to ask you know, about you too I, I have a hard time Looking at you and thinking, oh, you're going to be 50? You're going to yeah. be 50? Yeah. Do you have a hard time with that too? I, the other day it hit me. It was just like I always knew. I never really cared about age. The other day, just the phrasing of, oh, right, in May I'm 50 was weird. That was funny. And I always thought about, uh, I remember when, I think it was Mac, when Macaulay Culkin turned 40 or something, he sent out a social media thing that was like, hey, you want to feel bad? The guy from Home Alone's forty now, you know, and I thought about that when I was turning fifty. I was like, "Hey, you want to feel bad about yourself? Travis is fifty. <laughs> Travis, the skateboarder, is fifty. So, or not yet. He will be. You're okay with that? Yeah, I'm fine with that. Uh, tell I'm me fine with I'm fine with that. Truthfully, I'm fine with that because I've been fortunate enough that my career has had a bunch of different things in it, and I wasn't, you know, if I was one character, if if everywhere I went it was only Travis. I could see over the years that being a thing. Knock on wood, I've been lucky enough to have, whether it's Travis or Road Trip or Rat Race, like that's a fun thing. When someone comes up and says, what do I know you from? Usually you're like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to go over my whole resume with you right now. But it's also a compliment because it's like, there are a bunch of different things. I don't know. And I usually have to go by the demographic. Like when I meet someone, I'm like, all right, do you have kids? It might be Garfield. Wait, are you a teenager? Oh, you went to college in my age? Okay, you're Road Trip. You know, or a family? Rat Race. You know, so... I've had fun with that, so I do enjoy. I enjoy that part of the job. It's just you know to be able to continue to do it. So I think that's one of the things why um, I've enjoyed it is that I get to mix it up. If you don't, it's tougher. It's you know, um, and I've had that. I've had you know I've played 
I get a lot of offers to play the stoner guy and things like that, and it's up to you whether you want to do it or not. I would imagine Keanu Reeves probably got that same thing after Bill and Ted for a while. I imagine he absolutely does. You know. Probably way more than I do. Uh, Maybe. And we'll be right back. I would say, and anytime I get interviewed by anyone that wasn't you, my first question was always, where's Steve Cometco? Not because I wanted him to interview me. I just want to see him. Where is he? I want to know he's real. It's like He's real. You said just before you came here, you were busy dadding. I was dadding. Yes, I was dadding. Tell me about that. Um, you have a daughter who's going to be 21. I have two, I have two youngins. I have two girls. Uh, one's uh, going to be 21. The other's 13. And uh, yeah. Uh, and um, they're great. <laughs> I, I enjoy it. It's my favorite. It's my favorite job. Way more than acting. Way more than writing is being a dad. So. Do you tell them the same kinds of things your mom told you? It's interesting. My twenty-year-old is in school for acting, and it is—it's that it's tough because there's the dad part of me goes, "Oh fuck no, absolutely not! I don't want you to have that life, no." And the artist, whatever you want to say, actor in me goes, yeah, "It's tough. I'm I'm going to tell you not to do the thing I've been doing since I was eleven years old." Um, but again, my parents—I had a de- my parents had a deal that I think a lot of parents have with kids, which is. You go to college, we pay your way. If they can, we go to college, we pay your way. If you don't, you're on your own. Meaning if you're not going to go to college, then get a job. And that was presented to me. And I'd been working a bit. Again, nothing giant, but I'd been gradually working. And I applied to one college. I wasn't thinking about college too much. I always thought I'd be a kindergarten teacher. And I knew you had to go to college probably for that. And this came the moment when I was 18. I thought it's either acting or college. I don't really think of myself as going to college, but I'll apply. And I applied to one. I just followed my older brother. I was like, oh, you applied to Northridge? Okay, I will. And they said, what do you want to do with you? What do you want to major or whatever? I had to fill out. And I was like, acting? I don't know. And they said, you got in? I was like, I don't care. (laughs) And so I was about to go. And I booked a pilot. That didn't even end up going. But I booked a pilot, a paying job. And I was like, I'm going to try it. And if I don't, I might go back to college or I might get a job, whatever. And that was it. And so I just kept doing it and I kept doing it so it's tough as a dad to say no because I did it um but I also it's different it's a different time now the business is different um social media wasn't around when I was a kid I mean it got by the way I can't thank people more for the fact that this didn't get invented when I was young and stupid and making the dumbest mistakes and bad jokes and you know just stupid shit oh yeah they come down on you there's a million people out there at least i couldn't imagine that i mean i really having two daughters in the world of social media is it's new we never i mean for so many years no one ever had to deal with that yeah you had to deal with phones phone call okay you can't be on the phone after 10 and then it became cell phones and then it's all right well you can't be on your cell phone till after 10 then it became social media you know all these screen time things and everything like that never existed so Uh, it's definitely different. I don't know it's easier. It's definitely just different. It is different. Sitting here listening to you, uh, I mean this in the best possible way, do you realize how lucky you have been that you got that first job and you you never really... I've talked to so many people over the years Mm -hmm. who've really had to work and gone through disappointment and, you know, nose to the grindstone and all that stuff. Yeah, and I've had versions of, again... You know, everyone has their own, everyone runs their own race. And mine was fortunate in the way that I kept working. I did have things, you know, after Clueless, when I, or sorry, right before Clueless. Uh, again, I think I was, I'm so bad with times. You guys can Google it and figure it out. But uh, I was around 18 or 19 when I booked Clueless, and then it came out when I was 20. And right before I booked Clueless, as a young actor kid going on his own without not going to college and paying his own way since... I moved out when I was 17, and that was on me. When I was 18, right before Clueless, I blew everything. I had no more money. I blew all my money on being a kid. And n- nothing stupid. I wasn't buying cars or anything like that. I was literally, I'm going to go fly to see my ex- my girlfriend who's doing a movie of the week in Australia. I'll go see her. And then, oh, I want to go see her again, and I'll do that. And then, oh, we broke up. I'm going to go home now. You know. And I did, So I blew all my money, and I called my dad, and I said, I don't want anything I don't want any money but I need help I don't know how to budget it seems I have this much left and it was something like five thousand dollars and my rent I think was 730 and so I was like this is all I have 
for the foreseeable future. How do I make this last? And he was basically like, you can't essentially, but first thing, stop driving your car because that runs on gas. If you don't need to do it, don't. No problem. I got a skateboard. That's fine. Um, I didn't have my heat turned on. I moved into a new place and I, I, I was like, I'm broke. I'm going to move into a new place and I need help budgeting. I didn't get, and my dad did not suggest this. This was me doing this. He suggested budgeting. I was like, well, I'll go one better. So I didn't get heat turned on, didn't get, which includes hot water. I didn't get gas turned on. I had power and that was it. I had no furniture. And my address was a third and I was above a garage. And if I sneezed, the guy in the garage would bless me. That's how thin <laughs> everything was. And I had the car that I bought when I had some money as a 16-year-old kid. So my Pathfinder, which looked like the car in Tango and Cash, which is why I got it, would just sit out front on the street with no one driving it because I was on my skateboard. And so because I didn't have hot water, I also didn't have a shower. I had cold water in the shower if you want, but that was it. And so I didn't have laundry. And so once a month, I would take my laundry bag, throw it on my shoulder, and skateboard from deep North Hollywood to Encino to where Seth Green lived. You're kidding. No, and Seth Green lived. And Seth was doing commercials and had some nice apartment, and he had a washer and dryer. So I would skateboard with my la- with that my laundry. That is a good friend. Yeah, it's a great friend. I would skateboard with my laundry to Sethy's house, do my laundry, throw it over my shoulder again, skate back home, or and use his house to shower. And then my audition for Clueless, if you know Los Angeles, I was in deep North Hollywood. The audition was at Paramount, which is, you know, Melrose and Always. Gower. Yeah. Very far away. Almost impossible to get there without a freeway or a canyon. And I was only on a skateboard. So I skateboarded from deep North Hollywood over Highland, Coanga by the Hollywood Bowl to Paramount to audition for Clueless because I didn't have money for my car. So I arrived sweating, greasy, long haired, <laughs> gross dude, but also kind of fit the part of little skater stoner kid. Um, but yeah, so that's where I was, that's where I was living when, uh, when kind of the shit hit the fan. So I, I did, sorry to get back to your, my long winded answer. I do, recognize how lucky I'd been that I continued to work even through those valleys when luckily my dad kind of was like spend this a month and during that time when I had no hot water or anything was my audition for Clueless and I booked it and it gave me enough money to pay my rent and get out of that apartment uh, the next year and so that so yeah in the hindsight yeah it really did change my life because I was living it was bad it was dark time so much so I remember I said it's the only time ever I've thought about quitting I never have, really. I don't even know if this would count, but I was auditioning for ER when it was like a guest spot. And I never did guest spots as a kid. I just, I was, I don't know why. I just never booked them, really. And this was a very, you know, a tortured uh, patient in ER. I was in the waiting room with Seth. He was auditioning, too. Seth, he was auditioning. And I was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. He's like, what? I don't know what this is. Like, I don't know how to, and I just kind of this, kind of this, whiny bitchy freak out where I was like I don't know if I can do this I don't want to do this and Sethi was great we weren't that close he was just like the fuck are you talking about this is what you've done your entire life by the way you don't want to do it don't fucking do it but don't bitch and say you don't know how to do it that's a cop out and it was so great and I went in to the audition did terrible didn't get it of course but the next audition was this NYPD Blue audition and I heard Seth in my head say like you know how to do this. And I booked it. And the next audition after that I was when I met Ryan Phillippe, oddly enough, I booked that as well. And that's very rare that you book like two things in a row, but it was momentum. And it, it started me up again. And I thank Sethi for that every day that it was, you know, it, every now and then it takes your friend to kick in the Some, ass. Yeah. Sometimes you, you just know? need a, a voice. Yeah. You just need either a sounding board or a voice to go, Hey, stop. Don't be so hard on yourself. And by the way, it is a really, it's a lottery of an occupation. You know, to get one job is a lottery, and to get two is unheard of, and three, hey, you got a career. But um, I do, I, I realize now having seen all that, whether it's the Nickelodeon documentary, all that stuff is, and my mom passed away recently, but holy shit, did, do I owe her a debt of gratitude for keeping me safe in that world. I don't mean safe sexually, or I mean everything. I just mean as a kid, I had a childhood. I was an actor who was working almost nonstop since I was 11, but I had a childhood. And I had a pretty good relationship with my mom. And I have a good relationship with my, a great relationship with my dad. And my mom was never my manager. My mom was never 
my mom had a career. She was a microbiologist at UCLA, couldn't give a shit about supercuts. My dad's a professor at USC at the time, couldn't give a shit, you know. Trojan and Bruin couldn't give a shit about supercuts and all that. Um, but they were supportive. But they weren't living through me, and they weren't, I wasn't the cash cow. They weren't, they weren't surviving because of me. Um, so I hear a very practical voice coming out of you. Yeah, it's weird. I think it's age. <laughs> but no, I think it's them. Uh, truly, I think it's my parents, the fact that my mom, I mean, I so, it's so boring. I apologize. But I've it's seen people. Uh, uh, it's just, you know, uh, the older I get, the more I reflect on how I got here, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. everything that's gone on. Uh, and it all adds to the person you become, every, yeah. every little experience. Yeah, it takes a while to look back at it. It's funny, like, looking back, like I watched that Nickelodeon thing recently, and it was amazing to see the, I remember going into auditions as a little kid, and there would be mothers with their ears against the door, mother and dads, who with their ears against the door hearing their kid audition. Whatever, fine, you want to do that. But when they come out, they would berate their kid. Be like, Sammy, I told you, you didn't hit the line, you're... We went over that in the car. Why didn't you hit your? We're not stopping for ice cream. That. And it sounds silly and goofy, but that's fucking dreadful. You know, on a day, you do that, you have four auditions a day. Four times you're under that kind of pressure and stuff. And she wasn't doing it intentionally. It wasn't a calculated move, but my mom was just, didn't want to do that. She didn't, this wasn't her dream or anything like that. So... She never was on set. She was always on set looking at... She was always aware, uh, present. But she wasn't the mom watching me like that. She would... If I was needed, she was always there. She was always with her book, her mystery book or whatever, in the far corners behind all the other stage moms. And they'd always ask her, you know, like, how come you're not moving up there? And she's like, I'm just doing what he's doing. That's all right. And it was really because it just made her uncomfortable. It's a weird scene to see... Kids, adult, sitcom life is weird, and kid acting is strange a lot with school. School you have to do during it and all that, but they, uh, she really did. Like, she, she'd watch, she'd watch, and she was proud of me, by the way, make no mistake, she was super proud, but she wasn't, she was never pushing. She was supportive, but never pushing me, which was pretty great. You said you were close with Gary Shandling, too. Yeah. His death came as kind of a surprise, kind of a surprise. Yeah. Out of nowhere. Yeah. Yep. I believe it was a heart attack, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I don't even know what technically the final. He was a good guy, blows. too. Gary was incredible. And Gary, one of the things that I, I never, one of the things about Gary that I never knew as much, I knew during, but I don't think other people knew as much until after. I don't know if that's English, what I just said. I'll start over. <laughs> one of the things that I don't think people knew and I didn't know as much of, about how much he mentored other people. And not just comics. Like, I know a lot of comedians who mentor other comedians. Gary was for everybody. Whether it was Sasha doing Borat, whether it was Favreau doing Iron Man, whether it was Favreau doing Jumanji, or all these things. When we'd play basketball at Gary, sorry, there would be... We'd play ball, and then around noon or so, we'd all just eat and hang out. And a lot of times people would come by who weren't in the basketball game to just chat with Gary. I have friends, when I started show running first a uh, second person I reached out to was Gary and because Gary ran the Larry Sanders show which to me is one of the greatest comedies ever and he like a kind of war-torn general gave me advice on how to run a show and how to be a boss and how to be involved and involve your writers and um just be a really j just to, how to be a boss I'd never done it before I always worked for other people um but he mentored so many people and was so helpful for everybody I knew, whether it was a stand-up, was a writer, whether it was a director, whether it was a musician, would go to Gary for advice on life, on music, on directing, on writing, on acting. Um, and he was always so great about it. And it is the exact opposite of kind of the persona that is Gary Shandling. So I've been really lucky with the people I've been able to work with and become friends with. I met Gary because we had the same makeup guy. Um, and I was a huge fan. I like basketball, so I got invited to play. Um, but yeah, and again, his, his, his death, I mean, talk about just two people who are gone way too soon, very different ages, but Brittany and Gary both, I'm bummed we don't get to see more of their stuff. You know, that's disappointing. That's selfishly as a fan, you know. So. You sound like you've got it knocked. No, 
I just have. A, I mean, I'm. And I again. I as I get older, I look back and as I look back and I just think, as a parent, I'm like, my, my folks did pretty good for someone who's in the business because there's a lot of other versions that aren't as uh, that don't have as nice of a progression ending. Whatever. And it's not over yet, but you know what I mean. Um, no, it's tough. And again, having a daughter who wants to do it, it's a very different time. I'm very curious. But she's a better actor than I. She's more trained than I am already, and she's 20. So, um, but it's also, again, it's the lottery. So. But did you remember, I don't even know if, you, I'm sure you do. I used to say your last name in almost every press junket I did. I don't know if you remember no. that. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I swear, if there was B-roll, they could go through the files of E. The amount of times, because when you first start doing uh, press as a young actor, in, in Clueless, by the way, exactly, the Clueless junket, we were doing the Clueless Junket, and Donald Faison and I had never been interviewed before. And there's all these cameras and stuff, and we see E comes in to interview us, and we know the logo, and there's E. And your last name, for some reason, was like an earwig in my, it just burned into my brain. Where, I swear, you could find it. There's B-roll of me doing an entire interview, and the only answers I give are Cometco. The only answers I give are Cometco. Because it was, I like that. It was the most. I don't know if it's the K sounds or what, but it was just. Anytime I get interviewed by anyone that wasn't you, my first question was always, "Where's Steve Cometco?" Not because I wanted him to interview me. I just want to see him. Where is he? I want to know he's real. It's like he's real. Yeah. Now I know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I would say your name all the time. Me, Adam Scott Rudd. I remember we would all enjoy the name Cometco. I interviewed Paul once. Yeah. Yeah. Funny guy. Boy, Sweetheart. his career's taken off. Sweetheart. Yeah. Sweetest guy on the planet. Clearly, you know, eats babies or drinks vampire blood. But That's other than something, that, huh? yeah. He'll never die. No. No. Paul Rudd siempre viva. He'll just live forever. Uh, what are you working on now? Uh, what am I working on now? We just did our, I don't even know what number it is. Our, oh God, I can't think of it. 12th season of Robot Chicken, I think. We've done a new special for Robot. We just finished writing. Uh, Mark Paul Gossler and I, who I did Franklin and Bash with, uh, sold, have a new show at NBC, a new pilot that we're doing, um, a procedural together. And then uh, I think there's a movie I did called Quarter that is coming out soon. I'm so bad at this stuff. I, I keep working, but I don't know when it all comes out. As long as you remember the name Kometko. I remember fine. the name Kometko. That's all I need. That's like that's my safe word. <laughs> Oh, In any aspect it's my of danger my life, word. it is my safe word. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever met anybody else named Reckon? Since me now, yes. Uh, before, no. I mean, I've, I've, I've had people come up who have said, hey, I've named my son after you. This is Brecken. Um, so I've met a couple kids. There was one actor, one young actor I met named Brecken. And I get people on social media who are like, oh, I named my kid or dog after you. And it's not That's really kind of neat. Coming. It's just the name. Yeah, my dad, I'm pretty sure my dad was high. When he heard it, it was his friend's brother, and it was spelled in the real Welsh way, which is C H umlaut. I have no idea. But when the when it was born, when I was born, they said, "What you know? How do you spell the name?" And my dad was like, "B R E C K." He spells it wrong. B R E C K I N is how he decided to do it. My brothers are Adam and Frank, and I'm Brecken. It makes no sense. Did Birkenstock ever come through for you? No, you know, I played, uh, yeah, because in my head, Travis Birkenstock was always some heir, some celeb you, whatever you want to, uh, Nepo baby to the Birkenstock fortune. I always thought about that. Um, and I'm sure Amy named it that because he was kind of a modern hippie. But no, I never got a Birkenstock. I never even got one. Not even one shoe, let alone a pair. Uh, no, I never got Birkenstock. And I've never owned a pair of Birkenstocks. Maybe I've subconsciously been protesting. Well, maybe if you were a lesbian. There you go. <laughs> See? That's what's That's a missing. joke. That's, That's a joke. Missing. I could. I could stretch as an actor. So. Thanks a lot. Yeah, man. Thank I you. I enjoyed so much. this. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I wasn't I didn't know what quite what to expect since we'd never this is it. talked before. This is the ABC. But I enjoyed this. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>